excited that you're tuned in today and today is a super super special day um, I'm gonna try to get it worked into where we can pan through this sanctuary in the video but right now I am looking at a bunch of beautiful faces staring right back at me as I do this welcome and as I preach today and as we do our Wednesday night stuff it's amazing and I'm so thankful for all of y'all that submitted photos for those of you that put these photos up this is simply amazing and it couldn't have come at a better time. I mean, just with all the stuff that's going on, this bright spot in my week, in my, um, it's gonna be a, spr a bright week in my whole COVID-19 era. I'll never forget this, and I'm so thankful for it. But um, as we sit here right now, I just wanna say welcome to Grace Baptist Greenbrier. I hope you're tuning in. Uh, share this with somebody. Let them know that the Lord loves them, and just um, enter into worship with us as we pray. Father God, Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for all you do god thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship you thank you for the opportunity that we have to preach your word thank you for the opportunity that we have to call you our savior and to know that our god does surely save god thank you again for your provisions thank you for sending your son jesus that died for us and god we just um we just give you all the praise all the honor all the glory for everything that you do in jesus name amen amen
there in the ground His body lay Light of the world by dark And his sleigh And bursting forth In the glorious listen to other pastors and and um i guess you would say steal from their sermons and last sunday after driving church ended i got in my truck and um, on the way home i was listening to family radio and there was a a pastor on there by the name of rick warren preaching a sermon about being able to trust god's word and as soon as i heard him take off on that i was like that is a good message. That's a good message. I'm going to have to um, take advantage of some of the things that he's talking about in here. And so I learned in college and, and, and the little bit of seminary that I've taken that as long as you give reference, it's not really stealing. Um, and so I'm going to give him the credit for a lot of the ideas that were in um, this sermon. Um, and But the thing about that is it's so timely and it's so good and it was so rich that I had to share that with you. And I'm just going to put my pride to the side and let you know that this are my original thoughts with none of my thoughts are original thoughts. I've learned everything I know from somebody. Um, but these aren't my original thoughts. And, um, and, and I just, um, I guess I just want you to know that and understand that before I get going. But what I want to talk about today is how you can trust God's word and, and how it's proven itself true over and over and over and over and over again. Um, we see that all scripture is God breathed. Um, um, God's breath is, is what's on the, the pages of this book right now. You hear me and what you're hearing is Johnny's 
breath, okay? I, you know, I'm not a scientist, and we're going to learn a lot more about me not being a scientist as we look at this message, but, um, and, and I'm not a doctor. I can't tell you everything about human anatomy, how it, it all works, but I do know that when I open my mouth to speak, air comes out, flows over my vocal cords, and then you hear my voice. But basically, what you're hearing is, is my breath. These are the thoughts that I'm breathing out to you. So right now you're listening to the breaths of Johnny, but when we read the Bible and when I quote from the Bible, you're hearing straight from God's breath, straight from God's mouth. Um, God's word it, it is his very breath and it's his words to us. And we see in Psalms chapter 119 uh, where it talks about all of your commands can be trusted. We can trust everything that God tells us. All right, we can trust everything in this book. But we have to get to the point where we know and we understand that we can trust it. And, and, and so a lot of times we ask the question, how do we know that what's in the Bible is true? How do we know? People ask the question all the time when people, um, you talk to a skeptic or somebody who's not a believer or somebody who, um, you know, is an atheist or an agnostic. How do you know that God's word is true? It, 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 it was written by a bunch of men. That's not what I believe about God's word. I believe it's God's breath. I believe it's God's message to us. Okay, um, we, we can come up with that easy response and say you can trust it because of faith. But sometimes it takes more than just trusting it by faith to build somebody's faith. We have to look at the proof and the evidence. And there's lots of proof and lots of evidence. There's lots of irrefutable truth. I like truth that can't be cracked. I like things black and white. And, and sometimes that causes me to struggle because I like structure. I like, I like for things to be written down exactly what I'm supposed to do so I know. So I don't step outside of those lines and I can stay inside the lines. And, and people, people all over the world struggle with the Bible. We see it. We see it written about in secular magazines, Time Magazine, two different times. Put something on the cover about can God's word be trusted? Is God's word the truth? The Bible, is it fact or is it fiction? This issue needs to be settled and it needs to be settled in the world, but really it needs to be settled in the hearts of believers because there are a lot of people who believe that Jesus is God's son, that he died on the cross for your sins, he buried him bar two on the third day, God raised him from the dead. And so we have salvation, but then there's so many other things that we don't believe about the Bible. And, and I fall under the, um, the thinking that we have to believe the Bible. We have to believe the Bible for what it is. Now, I'm not saying you have to believe every different man's interpretation of the Bible because if I was to bring in um, 20 different pastors and, and, and start breaking down passages of Scripture, we'd get a lot of different interpretations. But what I am saying is that we have to believe this as a whole to be the truth. And most of us can believe that it's the truth and, and that, that it's God's word given to us. And so when we just break it down and we take... The, the man element out of it and we just look at it for God's word and God breathed and God centered and everything about this is from God not anything in it is from a man then it changes everything about the way that we live our lives and change about everything everything about the way that we serve him so we have to get this settled and what it comes down to is the Bible has to be the authority. Some people, science is the authority. Some people, my friends are the authority. Some people, um, the person I listen to, CNN is my authority. Fox is my authority. But the Bible has to be our authority. And we need to know that we can trust it. We need to know, and I'm telling you, as we get back to the basics and we continue looking at the basics, this is the most basic thing of Christianity is God's word to us, what he's told us to do. So as we break open his word and as we look at it, my prayer is that you look at it from a different way than you ever have. So we're going to look at a few ways that the Bible proves itself to be true. And just as a side note, this is so much more fun preaching with all y'all looking at me than it was to just preach to a bunch of empty chairs. I love this, and I love the fact that y'all did this for me. I can't get over it. 
I can't get over uh, um, what, what this is like and how much this means to me. Um, and, and if you don't know, go check out our Facebook page and look down and you'll see a video of all the pictures that are looking back in um, at, at me in here right now. And it's just, um, it, it was one of the greatest things. So thank you for that again. I can't say thank you enough. I'll be saying thank you for that until I'm probably laying in the grave. I'll probably remember this through Alzheimer's. But I, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. But as we get to the to the word of God, I want to I want to read one more passage of scripture with you. Psalms chapter 33 and verse 4 says, The word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all that he does. Father God, we love you. We thank you that you're faithful in all that you do. We thank you that your word is rightful and true, God. And I thank you that, that we've been given faith to believe it. But we've been given facts to believe it. So, God, we thank you for the facts. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing that we can look at in the Bible to know that it's true is it's historically accurate. Not only is it true doctrinally, you know, we can talk about doctrine. Uh, we can talk about theology. We can talk about ethics. We know that it's, it, it, it's true in all of those things, but it is true historically. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, it says it's impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. You know, a lot of times people will be like, well, do you think God can't do? You know, they try to trip you up on that. And they're like, um, you know, like, well, no, there's nothing God can't do. Well, can, uh, can he make a mountain so big that he can't move it? Well, you got me. So uh, if anybody ever says, is there anything that God can't do? Yeah, there are things that God can't do. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. He's, he's, he's righteous. You know, we see Jesus. When Jesus was here on earth, Jesus could not lie. <laughs> now, I don't know if Jesus had a crafty way, but, you know, like, if, if, if somebody walked up to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, does this vest make me look fat? I don't know how Jesus will answer that. But, um, you know, one time I went up to Autumn and I put on this sweater. And I'm not much of a sweater guy because I feel like sweaters make me look fat. And so one time I went up to Autumn. I was like, Autumn, does this sweater make me look fat? She looked up at me and she said, no, it's not the sweater. <laughs> that hurt my feelings just a little bit. But, I mean, I don't know anybody in the world has got more integrity than Autumn. She's, she's got more integrity than anybody I've ever seen, anybody I've ever met. It's one of the things I love so dearly about her, and she wasn't going to lie to me through that. She's going to give me, she's going to tell me what's true. Like, if I go home and after a while, and um, I'm like, baby, what'd you think about that sermon? She's going to tell me. She's going to tell me if she thought it was good. She's going to tell me if she thought it was bad. She's going to tell me where I messed up. She's going to tell me you said, um, too much. She's going to say, and, and three times you said, but, um. And so she's, she's going to correct me. She's going to get me on the straight and narrow. She's going to be like, you stuttered too much today. Um, she's going to tell me the truth, okay? Um, when, when Jesus was around, Jesus could not lie. He was fully righteous. If he'd ever lied, then everything about Jesus would have been a lie. But he never lied. God cannot lie. God will not lie. God is truth, and we know that. If there's anything in this Bible that's not the truth, then it's not godly. It's not from God. So here's the thing. The word of the Lord is rightful and true. Psalm 33, 4 again. He is faithful in all that he does. So we're going to look at this. And rather than just what the word of God says, we're going to see how the word of God has been proven over and over and over again. So how do we know that the Bible is historically true? Well, one of the reasons is it's written like a good history book. Most of the things in the Bible that we see, everything is from an eyewitness account. We, we can go back in the, in the Bible. We can read, you know, Moses was there at the parting of the Red Sea. He was an eyewitness to that. He, he, he gives his account of that. He writes about it. Um, Joshua was there when the walls of Jericho came down. He wrote about that. Um, it's in the book. It's historically true. There was eyewitness accounts. The disciples were there when Jesus appeared in the upper room. You know, Matthew, Mark, John, they were there. They wrote it down. Luke talked to all of them and also Mary for the eyewitness accounts. He wrote it down. Peter was there. He told a guy named Mark and Mark wrote it down. Um, we, we know from the historical data that 
This is true that it really happened. We, we see this. Archaeology, a, a part of history, as we look up history and try to find history, it backs it up. You know, we look through the archaeology, uh, archaeological things in the Bible, and we see um, and we read about cities that um, were in the Bible, but they, only, they didn't exist forever, and people thought, well, they just made it up, kind of like the Hittites. People always thought that the skeptics thought that there was never a group of people named the Hittites. They thought that it was made up by people who wrote the Bible. But then they get out there, they start doing excavation, they dig up this city, they find these people. And guess what? Through the writings and the things that they find along with it, it's the Hittites. And so now it's historically proven that the Hittites existed, even though for a long time people thought it was just made up um, um, mumbo jumbo put down in the Bible. But actually, they really existed. It really was true. And they found proof of that. Let's take, for instance, the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are dated to about 100 years before Jesus. And they contain all the writings of the Old Testament. Other than Esther. So you got the Old Testament there. A hundred years before Jesus. It was written down. Put in this cave. And then somebody discovered these scrolls. Okay. And, and, and here's what they found when they got those scrolls. Um, um, through the archaeology that's proven that the history is true. Um, um, when they were discovered, the, the oldest copies of scrolls that we had at that time were 900 years after Jesus. So basically what we have is a thousand years between our most, our oldest copy, which was 900 years after Jesus, and then you got a copy now that's 100 years before Jesus. And as they sat down and they looked through the Dead Sea Scrolls and they compared them to the, to the, to the ones that were written a thousand years later, they came down to the fact that they were 95% accurate, 95% the same 95 percent and basically the five percent that wasn't the same that wasn't accurate that, that didn't line up with the day was the the spelling of some names and some words now the the content was exactly the same and so what we have to do is we have to look at that and we have to realize that you know what over 900 years people took such great care in copying the pages of scripture that it stayed it stayed historically true. And, you know, there was methods for writing the Bible. Some people say, well, it's so old and it's been changed over time. How many times have you heard people say, well, how in the world does a book that, that's old as the Bible as you claim it is, how does it not get changed over time? People have, have wrote it and they put their own ideas into it and they changed things up. Well, here's how they wrote the Bible. Here's how they copied the scrolls. Here's how they copied the text. They did it. They didn't do it word for word. They did it letter for letter. And so when they would write a page or a section or, 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 or you know, and they had the specific um, measurement on how big everything was supposed to be, then they would go on that section and count the letters. If one letter was off, they threw that scroll away and they started over. They made sure that over time it stayed accurate. And we can see that um, from from. A thousand years, it stayed accurate. I don't know how we can, any other way, through historical context and archaeology, come up with anything better than that. But as we look through the Bible, and we know of the discoveries that's been made of late, we can read about cities in the Bible, and then all of a sudden, they, they thought they didn't exist, or they didn't know where they were, and they dig them up. They dig them up. Um, there are things that are mentioned in the Bible that weren't seen for years and years, but, you know, they, they, they dig them up, like the Pool of Siloam. You can go to Jerusalem right now, and you can see the Pool of Siloam. You can see part of Herod's temple. Um, you can see places where Paul was, um, these, these um, theaters and places that Paul spoke. Um, that he talked, um, that he encountered people. You can go and you can find these places. It is historically accurate. 
The Bible's proven it time and time again. I could go on and on and on about how we've discovered the Bible to be historically accurate. I mean, it, I, what I have touched on is just a tip of the iceberg. But what I want you to know and what I want you to understand is it's historically accurate. And if you want to go and you want to start digging in the Bible and you want to start looking at the history of the Bible and you want to start learning about the history of the Bible and then you want to learn about the history of the world, if you, if you read about the history of the Bible and, and match it up, with the history of the world, the two will come together. And where there's discrepancies, the Bible corrects the discrepancy on the other side. It never happens the other way. And we'll see that again as we continue down into the discovery of science. Because the Bible, point number two, is also scientifically accurate. This is a big misunderstanding in the world today. God is the one who set up the laws of science. You know, we think now that, that as we go along, we're discovering all these laws of science. But basically what we do, there was some famous philosopher who said this, and I can't remember his name right now because we didn't write it down. But he, basically he said is what science does is prove what God already knows or what God has already proven. And we see that throughout the scriptures and we see that throughout time. We see that throughout the way that history changes. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, and, and hear me out on this. If the Bible is if anybody says the Bible is not scientifically accurate, they've probably not read the Bible. But the Bible is not set up to be a scientific textbook. Y'all already know that. I mean, you're not going to um, read the Bible to build a rocket. But the Bible never gives bad signs. That's the difference. The Bible never gives bad signs. Most of the time, it's ahead of science. There are things that the Bible says about science that, we have, that, that we've discovered in the last 500, 400, 300, 200, 100 years, um, 50 years, 25 years, yesterday that we didn't know before science. We're constantly learning things about science. And a lot of these things we know about science today God already knew and wrote about it in the passages of Scripture. We're constantly um, hearing things about science that, that, that God already knew. And I can guarantee you, he knows about all the laws of the universe because he created all the laws of the universe. We're still discovering things that he knew 6,000 years ago and an infinite time in front of that because he created them all. They were always there. He, he, you know, we can start talking about the attributes of God and, and how God is, how, how he's omniscient. <laughs> Um, you know, you look at that, he's omniscience. <laughs> he knows everything. He's omnipotent. He, he's omnipresent. I mean, God is, is amazing. We, I mean, we could just spend the rest of our time here bragging on God. And essentially, that's what we're doing because we're talking about how great and how smart God is and how science fails us. But God has never failed us. You think about the fact that science fails us. I'd love to get my hand on a, on a textbook from 1987, third grade science. I was in the third grade in 1987. And, and, but you know what? I can't walk into a third grade science room and pick up a textbook from 1987 because if I did, it would be obsolete. They don't teach out of those textbooks anymore because most things about science have changed since then. They've made more discoveries and, and the, the textbook from 1987 would be elite, uh, obsolete. A lot of those things in that, in that book are not believed or taught anymore. Think about medical science. It's constantly changing. I mean, you know, the, the Food and Drug Administration comes out and they're like, listen, don't eat eggs. I, when I was a kid, you know, eggs are really bad for cholesterol. If you eat eggs, you're going to die. And now it's like commercials talking about how great eggs are. If you look around, you'll see the um, advertisements from the, the 30s, the 40s, and 50s that say, you know, Nine out of 10 doctors recommend Marlboro or smoke Marlboro cigarettes. Nine out of 10 doctors. You think they've changed that? The way we treat people has changed. The way that people go into the hospital um, with the sickness and the way that we treat them coming out the other side has totally changed. One of our presidents, our first president, George Washington, he had a heart problem. And at that time, they thought that bloodletting in, in, in other words, bleeding out blood would help you um, heal from something. They thought your blood was bad, so they just let the blood out. Now we know, and we look in the pages of Scripture because we talk about how um, God's Word is ahead of science in the pages of Scripture. It says that our blood is life. 
But back then, they would let blood out to try to heal you. So they took George Washington, they let blood out. He didn't get better. So they did it again a second time. Uh, another day, they let more blood out. It didn't heal it. A third time, they let more blood out and they killed him. They bled him out. They killed him as a way of treatment. Now, uh, obviously, medicine has come a long way, but still, at one point in time, that was common. That was that was a treatment. And probably more people died through treatment than they than they healed. We know for a fact they probably did. But so many things changed. If you were to go to Paris, um, not Paris, Tennessee, but Paris, France. You know, we had talked about as a family going on a Paris vacation this year, but then we had decided we were going to um, out west to um, California and Yosemite National Park, San Francisco, and see all that stuff. But now we're probably going to go to um, 3547 Pinson School Road and just hang out at the house. Um, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? Who knows how things are going to change in the next couple of weeks, next couple of months? We may all go on vacation. We may not. Um, there may, I mean, who knows what's going to happen? But I was. Listen to this, and, and, and in the Louvre, it, of course, if, if you don't know, it's a famous musician. I think that's the place where they got the Mona Lisa. Um, and among uh, being an art museum and a museum and all this stuff, it's a world-class library. But in the Louvre, there's a section with three and a half miles of obsolete science books. You see, science changes every minute, but the Bible never changes. It's just proven more and more accurate. It's proven time and time again to be accurate. I want to read to you a passage of scripture from Psalm 148 real quick. Verses five and six, it says, let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. He set them in position forever and ever. He gave an order that will never pass away. His word doesn't change. His creation doesn't change. His science has never changed. He never gives bad signs, ever, never in the pages of scripture. In 1861, there was a book that came out called 51 Incontrovertible Truths. It took me a while to get that one out. 51 Incontrovertible Truths that the Bible is scientifically inaccurate. Somebody wrote a book that had 51 facts, 51 truths that could not be disputed that the Bible was wrong. The problem with that is today you can't find any scientists that will stand behind any of those facts. They've all been disproven by science. But you see, God, it never changes. Think about this. This is a little different. We know that the Bible is true because of what's not in it. Because what's not in the Bible, we know that it's true. If a man had written the Bible, it would probably contain the prevailing scientific thoughts of that day. How many thousands of years, of course, you know, I'm a young earth. I believe the earth is 6,000, give or take, give a little bit years old. That's what I believe. Now, they don't teach that in school. They teach um, millions or billions of years, but I believe that. So, if you look at the, if you look at science and over time and, and when people were here, science talks about um, the earth was flat. Everybody believed that the earth was flat, and it wasn't until um, Galileo and Copernicus and Columbus sailed the ocean blue and um, a long time ago. It wasn't until that point that they began to believe and study and realize that the earth was round, that it was a sphere, a ball. You would think that a man, if a man wrote the Bible, he would write in there and talk about the earth as if it were flat. However, it doesn't. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, um, contrarily says, God is enthroned above the sphere of the earth. 2,600 years 2,600 years before it's discovered that the earth is round. Long before anybody believed it, God said it 
and it was true. People always guessed it at what held the earth up. They thought that it was just this flat plane out there and something held it up. You know, if you look at the Hindus, they believe that a giant elephant held, held it up. But, but, so what, what's, what's the giant elephant standing on? What's holding the elephant up? So they believe that it was standing on the back of a giant sea turtle. But what's on the giant sea turtle up? They believe that it was on the back of a sea serpent. It was swimming around through a cosmic ocean. That's what they believed and that's what they taught their people. The Greeks believed that Atlas held the world up. But we look in the Bible, we don't see anything about Atlas holding up this flat world. The Egyptians, now think about this, the Egyptians, Moses would have been privy to all this information. That, and the, the Egyptians were brilliant. They were smart. They were intelligent people. And you can imagine that they had science class, science classes, and they taught, and they taught what they believed. You know, and the Egyptians believed that five pillars held it up. But you know what? Moses, with all the knowledge that he was given from the Egyptians, I'm sure some of that stuff carried over into his everyday life because he learned and he was a smart man. But he never once mentioned in the five books of the Bible when he's credited for writing that the earth was flat and held up by these five pillars. It never made it in there. Job chapter 26, verse 7, it says, God strengthens the sky over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. Job is probably the oldest book ever written in the Bible. Who told Job that? Who told Job that, that nothing holds up the earth? Who told him that? It wasn't the Hindus. It wasn't the Greeks. It wasn't the Egyptians. It was God. It was God. In the book of Job, we see that. It was God. There are so many things. So many things that we can look at. So many things that we discover. So many things that we learn. You know, men said there's only a thousand stars and then they came back and said well it's 1024 then they said or 1022 then 1026 but then we look at the bible and the bible said in jeremiah 33 22 that, that that the stars are infinite now man says they're infinite we can look at chemistry in the bible we can look at biology in the bible i mean we look at the levitical laws and we understand that the levitical the, the levitical laws a lot of those that had to do with food are scientific laws to protect the people. The Bible is completely accurate on science. You'll find no inaccuracies. Proverbs chapter 30 verse 5 says, every word of God is flawless. Psalms 12 6 says, the words of the Lord are flawless like silver refined in a furnace of clay and purified seven times. You see, my words are flawed. Every man's words are flawed. Everybody in this place looking back at me, your words can be flawed. That doesn't mean we don't speak truth sometimes, but your words can be flawed and they are. But God's word is never flawed. His words are flawless. He's a good, good God. And we can trust him. We can trust him today. In closing, as we've looked at God's word today, as we've evaluated God's word, as we've looked at all the different things that prove that God's word is true, I want you to know that you can trust his word. And even more than being able to trust his word, I want you to know that you can trust him. You can trust him, not just with that he's real, not with just that the word exists. You can trust him to be the God of your life. Maybe today you're sitting here and you're like, you know, I, I, I've looked at the Bible and the Bible's always been interesting to me, but I've never looked at it as being the 
true word of God. And I'm here to tell you, it is the true word of God. That's one of the most basic things about Christianity. If you can't believe the word in its entirety, then you can't believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried in a bar tomb, and on the third day, God raised him from the dead. And you can't make him your savior. But if you believe that everything in that Bible is true, the miracles are true, um, every word is true, and everything has a purpose, and it's perfect, just the way that God intended it, then you can believe that he died on the cross for your sins, and that he rose again and he's been resurrected. And one of these days you can believe that it says in the Bible that you'll be resurrected from the dead. And you'll stand before God and you'll spend eternity in heaven. But it's all about believing and trusting, having that faith, having that basic understanding of God's word. So if you're tuned in today and you've never truly believed, maybe today's the day that you believe. If you're tuned in today and you believe, but maybe Maybe it's gotten old to you. Maybe it's it's just a customary thing to you. Or maybe it's just a traditional thing. Maybe today would be the day that you say, I believe it. And I believe it's perfect in its entirety. And I want to serve that perfect God. If you're, here, if you're listening today and that's you, listen, I want to know about your decision. I want to be able to help you with it. I want you to text me your your name and decision to 615-581-7631. That's 615-581-7631. Or you can send me a message through Facebook. Or you can text me personally, 731-414-7719. Call me, whatever you need. I want to be able to help you and walk you through this decision. So I look at the faces here in this room. I know that there's several of you that um, have been coming for a while and maybe you've never joined Grace Baptist Church. There's no time like the present. There's no time like right now. We've had people join it, um, the church even through COVID-19. And maybe today you would say, I'm ready to join the church. We'll walk through that and we'll help you with that. And we'll see what that looks like in this world. But I will pray for us and then we're going to have one more song and then we're going to close this thing out. Father God, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for all you do. God, thank you for sending your son Jesus died on the cross for our sins. God, and thank you for proving that over and over and over and over again. Thank you for proving your word over and over and over again. There's no denying that you're real. There's no denying that your word is true. God, we love you for all you do to make it real to us. God, thank you. Thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name.
through this, God, if there's nothing on your back that doesn't have a good outcome for your cause, God, if you allow it to happen, if we allow that outcome to happen in our lives, God. God, we're so grateful for your love and your mercy and how just you are, God. God, we ask that you'll just please keep us safe. We ask all these things in your holy precious name. Amen.